Welcome to the Healthcare Provider Happy Hour. This is a safe space where we invite healthcare providers to unapologetically be themselves after the working day. My name is Jennifer George, and each week I will connect you with guests and stories that will help transform your stress to success and fulfillment. Are you with me? Grab your drink of choice and let's chat. Hey everyone, welcome to the Healthcare Provider Happy Hour. I'm your host, Jennifer George, and I'm joining you today with a special guest. His name is Sam Fiara. He's a storyteller, a writer, mentor, coach, problem solver, educator, and entrepreneur. His goal is to engage individuals in their personal and their professional development. He was also recognized by the Governor General of Canada for his work. Over the years, he's mentored hundreds of individuals and engaged and has added 45 plus non-for-profits that he has worked with over the years. Sam is the founder and chief motivating officer at Ignite the Dream Coaching and Consulting. It's a platform that engages his audience to define their path. He's also a lecturer at the Beattie School of Business at Simon Fraser University, where he blends academic and professional experiences into a rich environment that captivates his students. He's also a TEDx speaker. He's done two of them, and he does about 30 to 35 workshops a year. He's also an author and has authored the book Lost and Found, Seeking the Past and Finding Myself. Sam and I chat about what healthcare providers and what teams can do using the care principle that he established to help move through this pandemic with minimizing as much burnout as possible, deepening connection with one another and with our patients and also empowering our voice. So grab your drink of choice, join us. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, Sam. How's it going, Jennifer? Pleasure to be here. (laughs) It's a pleasure to have you. I'm glad we made it work today that we can sit and chat and have this conversation about healthcare and wellness and healthcare for providers and what that looks like at an individual level. So before you tell me about yourself, there's many things you do. Can you tell me about who you are? The best way for me to describe who I am, and this epiphany came to me a number of years ago. I shifted from what I do to who I am. And there are five things that guide and direct me in life. Servant leadership, story sharing, activator igniter, champion enabler, and community do-gooder. Those five things have become integral in my life. And as a result of it, it's enabled me to support and help people, teams, organizations, and nonprofits to be the best that they can be. It also has made me into a speaker, storyteller, mentor, coach, educator, uh, writer and blogger, uh, problem solver, entrepreneur, and as well as a community activator. But uh, it's the clarity that comes with regards to really understanding who you are. I did see, that, um, Sam, that you, you've won a governor, Governor's General Award in Canada, right? That's like a high a high prestigious reward for community like servant leadership. Is that kind of what it's based around? Okay. Can you tell us a bit about that and how that came to be? Sure. In, well, in 2012, uh, it was the Queen's Diamond Jubilee and they had the Queen's Diamond Jubilee medal for people who are involved and active and engaged in the community. And I was nominated and having mentored and coached about 5,000 people over the last 25 years, the testimonials were provided to the nominator, and that's uh, one aspect of it. And then in, I think it was 2016, I was a recipient of the Governor General's uh, Canadian Sovereign for uh, Medal for Volunteers. And again, it was just this acknowledgement. But the key thing, I think, is the, I call it an acknowledgement, and it's not an endpoint it's a starting point again, because after you are a recipient of such awards, you're like, okay, what else, what more can I do so that I'm not a bystander in life? Wow, I love that. Actually, when I had written my book um, back in 2019, that like you described that so well, because you get recognition for it. And then it's like, okay, now, 
you know, like you said, I kind of saw it almost as the end in a way, but to ignite it as a beginning, which I'm starting to do again, um, it just took me a little bit of time to get here again, but, but it did hit me. It was like, you know, this is a part of my legacy and contribution and to keep that going. Right. So just, yeah, it just evolves. So like you yourself along the way, along your life journey, have shared many roadmaps. You've talked about self-reflection. Um, you've talked about establishing and finding your own voice, mm-hmm. um, which I think is wonderful. And, and you've talked about getting through this pandemic uh, mm-hmm. using a care principle. Uh, so in healthcare, like how can you kind of bring these all together for us mm-hmm. in such a way that we can grow to be more resilient and stay compassionate and still provide um, the best care possible? Well, and I nothing but admiration and respect for anybody who's either in the healthcare industry or first responder. And I think the pressures, we've seen the pressures as a result of the pandemic. And, you know, what I've seen, though, is the fact that a principle emerged for me through the pandemic, whether, you know, you're working in an office and now you've been told to work from home. Uh, As educators, just on the turn of a dime, we were told, okay, from now on, you guys are actually going to be uh, teaching from online education, which many people had never done before. Mm -hmm. And in the whole spectrum of healthcare, your system is just overwhelmed. And I came up with this concept because I was thinking about it while in my outlet, and it came to me because I was thinking about how do we help and maneuver ourselves, not just myself, but it helps me too. And I came up with how we need to care right now. And CARE stands for Collaboration, Adaptability, Resilience, and Empathy. The importance of those four words, whether you are in healthcare, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, whether you are uh, working in an office, we need to care. Collaboration, which is the first one, is a reminder that we're not in this by ourselves. And we need to look around at the people who are around us. And how do we support each other? Maybe there's something that I'm doing that someone else has. And in fact, it was a beautiful example today. I met with one of my former students and, you know, she was like, well, I'm a, I do photography and social media. And I said, well, with my woodworking. And she said, you know what? I want to help you with this. And uh, so she's got a talent. It's going to cost me a table, which is I'm totally fine with. <laughs> I, um, think that, I think that sounds fair. <laughs> I think so. And um but the fact that, you know, people around us, don't, don't hesitate to reach out to people around you or have them reach out to you. Adaptability is we've had to change. And, you know, as a result of it, you have to be innovative, creative. But adaptability means looking at things from a different perspective in a different way. So when we suddenly flipped into online education, To me, it was actually a really easy transition, and I've been doing it for over a year now, but I know that some of my colleagues really struggled. And part of it is because, well, I thrive in ambiguity and uncertainty, and people think I'm crazy for that because they're like, why don't you like things simple and straightforward? I'm (laughs) like, it's not fun, so give me something complicated. And um, But adaptability is, I think, this mindset of looking at things and being innovative, creative, and... uh, Don't worry about change. In fact, change is not a bad word. Mm -hmm. Resilience is really significant because especially uh, in the healthcare industry, as well as, you know, when we look at COVID-19, you can't look at this at like a hundred meter dash. This is not over next week. It's not over next month. This is a marathon. When you're doing a marathon, you have to prepare your mind and your body for this and say, okay, we're in this for the long haul. And the resilience piece is building those components into your life to, number one, realize this is going to take time. The best way I can uh, describe this, Jennifer, is think of it this way. I, let's say if I have to get downtown to a meeting, I get in my car and I start driving. And I'm thinking about what I'm going to be doing in the meeting or having to talk about or even at the workshop. And I suddenly realize traffic is just jammed and it's not moving. And now all of a sudden I'm not prepared for this and I'm, you're, you're starting to, your mind is panicking and all that. Mm-hmm. Well, but if you look at it from a different way, before I leave home, let's say I, I turn it on to the news channel and they say, look, there's an accident on this part of the road. Okay, 
What's my next route? How am I going to maneuver around this? Uh, fortunately, in Vancouver, where I live, you can even hop on the C bus, which takes you right across the inlet to heart of downtown. But it enables me to then calm myself down, calm my mind, and prepare myself on how I'm going to get through it. So resilience is this whole piece of understanding. Let's calm the mind and let's figure out the best way to take this through the long haul. Empathy is the last piece. Empathy is care and compassion. We have no idea what the person next to you is going through. Uh, some people have been fine with COVID-19 and the processes and how it's gone through. Some have really struggled. Mm -hmm. Let's show care and compassion. Let's show uh, this empathy towards people because, you know, we have no idea what they're going through. And do you want to be the one that has actually been responsible for then, you know, having them have a breakdown or whatnot? Let's just take time and show empathy as well. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting because if you um, like if you write out care, C-A-R-E, empathy kind of goes back into collaboration in a way, right? It kind of is cyclical. So like a collaboration, so you said was kind of stemmed from engaging with others and kind of bringing people in, inviting people in and showing them that they're worth in a way and how totally. significant they are to the team and the operation. So what could leadership do? Mm -hmm. I know you, you educate on leadership quite mm -hmm. a bit and you coach on uh, leaders. So what could leadership do in the healthcare space? I know that's not necessarily where you work, sure. but the principles I would think are similar. Um, yeah. How can they facilitate a care model yeah. in their environment? Well, and uh, let me, pull it down a little bit further with regards to this concept of leadership. Right. Because uh, whenever I, you know, talk to people and I've had people come up and say, Sam, I want to be a leader. Like, how do I become a leader? And I mean, Jennifer, what I, when I'm in the company of people, I don't answer questions. I ask questions. Mm -hmm. My question back to people when they ask me, I want to be a leader. And uh, how do I be a leader? I'm like, well, why'd you come to me? And they're like, well, you're a leader said, okay, but what makes me a leader? And they use these beautiful words. I said, well, those are really nice things, but none of those things make me a leader. There's only one thing and only one thing that makes me a leader. It's followers. So the idea is, you know, leadership is not a place to be. Leadership is not a position. Leadership is a lifestyle. And what you do is demonstrating the actions and activities the people around you determine if you are worthy of that title and they will bestow that upon you. So, you know, that's, that's a point that I think is always missed because people are striving to this thing. Mm -hmm. Love that. And, well, and the other part I think that um, I would bring up in this situation as well is I think we've forgotten the most important thing. I think we spend 95% of our time thinking about this concept of leadership maybe 5% on this term followership. Mm -hmm. And we see followers as sheep. We see followers as people who, I'll tell you what to do and you will comply. No, no. Followers are the people who are there to say, you know, have you thought of this? Or, you know, I don't know if this is the right thing to do. Here's what my assessments are. And they're not in a capacity or the role of leadership but the followers are the ones that make the leader. So I think in a, in a, even in any setting, healthcare industry or uh, in any setting, I always say, look at the people around you. Listen to the people around you. Um, I am not the expert. And equally at the same time, I, be, I may be missing stuff. Now, if I just say, well, no, okay, that's great. Thank you and all that. And, you know, if you just sit in a boardroom and, you, you know, you just nod your head, okay, yeah, you're not giving service. But listen to the people around you. They have brilliant ideas. Mm -hmm. And, again, it goes back to collaboration. Because if you're not worried about who gets the credit, the titles, amazing things happen on teams when you work and, and strive together. So in, even in the healthcare industry, like someone sees something or hears something, I always say that uh, sometimes the higher you get up in an organization, sometimes you lose touch with the, the grassroots level. Mm -hmm. And I always say that person who's now, let's say five years you were in that role, but now you're in some sort of an administrative role, 
But that person, things have changed. But if they're seeing something, I want to know, tell me, like, let's, let's have a conversation. But I need to listen to that person who's in the trenches because there is so much value that I think we lose by thinking we have this position or this title. Right. And I think the title can be dividing, right? Mm -hmm. I think the title can um, make people, at least on the front lines, not feel like they can collaborate yep. with with the administrators and, and the executives, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not that they're, you know, anybody saying that, but I, I do think it just the title itself, it yeah. could be a bit div divisive. Um, so adaptability, can we talk a little bit about that? Because there's been a lot of adaptation in healthcare and in the community at large. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were already operating at a level where we were burning out pre pandemic, yep. and then the pandemic hit. And now we're, um, we, we get through it, we survive through it, let's say. A lot of people suffering post-traumatic, um, yep. suicide rates going up, addictions going up, um, just not well, people not, mm -hmm. not being well. Um, and now we're kind of post-pandemic for those who've made it through um, mm -hmm. in the healthcare world. And now this, I find, is also a trying time right now because I find people are exhausted. I yep. find um, we don't have our guard up as much as we did. We're kind of letting things go a little bit we have to because people are vaccinated and and you know the numbers are better and that's all good but now we're dealing with the aftermath and the heaviness of those emotions and um, maybe reflections and the processing of all of that so now how do we at, adapt now and in, back into getting into the normal mm -hmm. uh, mode of healthcare again yeah yeah no i mean uh, it's it's a very good point that you bring up because it's again you've been a almost like this Formula One race car, high performance, but that that cannot be sustained. Right. And, uh, you know, no matter how great somebody is, it's it's just not sustainable. And again, that's why I said nothing but admiration for the people in healthcare. You also had to put up with people who said, well, the pandemic's not real and, you know, this, and we're not wearing masks. And it just, it just went on and on. But majority, I think, were actually being a bit more, more reasonable in that regard. Mm -hmm. So now that we are, as you said, emerging out of this and the, the self-care that needs to take place now, I think now what we need to do is a few things. One is to start self-reflecting in this. You know, how are you feeling? How do, you know, now you can catch your breath and, you know, looking at it. And I remember I spoke at a, a wellness conference and I came up with this concept of, Either you're someone who is um, going through some challenging times or you're there to support the person through challenging times. As you know, I like acronyms. So I said, it starts with you. And starts means support. We need to create a supportive environment. So, you know, if somebody's not having a good day or they're just really starting to feel burned out, we need to create this supportive environment, even as a person who's looking after them. <laughs> T stands for trust, because once you create a supportive environment, trust establishes where they're willing to open up now. The A stands for appreciation. I think at this time, we've been so caught up in all of this, we've forgotten to appreciate the things in life around us. Mm -hmm. So start appreciating uh, even the small things. And the way to appreciate is by reflecting. And maybe this is where we need to spend more time on reflecting, slowing the mind down a little bit and taking the time for ourselves to reflect. And the last T of starts is talk, the art of conversation, mm -hmm. sitting down and just sharing with people who aren't going to judge you, who are going to listen to what you have to say. And the last S stands for strength, because once we go through this, we emerge stronger and we have strength to then move forward and carry on but it's a bit of a process that we need to go through in order to emerge out of this love that and I, I think the reflection piece I would love to dive into a little more I've always been a fan of reflection it's something I've advocated on this podcast about for providers in order to move forward it, it's so important to reflect and process and um and kind of let it go in a way too, um, right? Once you've done all that. 
So can you tell us like a lot of feedback I'll get from providers is that it takes too much time or they're worried about what might come up, um, things like that. So, or, or even just the basics of how to do it. I mean, I have my own ways of doing it that serve me, but everyone's different. And, and if you have something else to share, how can people practice a self-reflective journey? Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things I would say. One is the moment you find an outlet, all of a sudden you've got the space to start reflecting. I'll give you an example. So, you know, multiple projects on the go with me. And I just find that uh, in June of last year, we were going through a major renovation. Our designer said, okay, we're put, we'll put a Ikea table here. And I looked at this and I'm thinking at this future wall, no, I'm going to make my own table. <laughs> so I started, I, I went and I bought the lumber and the legs and I did all the work and uh, built my own table. And from that emerged an outlet, which has now become woodworking. But what I find is embracing that woodworking and embracing the outlet, as I call it, it provides me the space to let all of the things around me, the teaching, the speaking, the writing, the blogging, everything, because I'm, I'm in that woodworking zone, but it's freed my mind. The physical activity is there, but it's freed my mind. And all of a sudden, I'm unlocking those gridlocks of how do I make a better lecture or how do I engage in this difficult conversation? So part of it is finding this outlet because then that will free your mind in order to start reflecting. And this could be where somebody just goes swimming. It could be yoga, bike riding, whatever your heart sings. Okay, I could see that because it brings joy to you, really, right? And That's it perfect. frees you yeah, from and all of the daily activities. Right. And now all of a sudden your mind starts going. And it's amazing. It's, it's unlocked ideas and things for me that you're, you, but you always, I always keep a notepad next to me when I'm woodworking because all of a sudden the idea pops and I'm like, wait, wait, wait. And then I stop the sander, get the face mask off, take the goggles off, and I quickly jot down my idea just so I don't lose it because it comes to you. And, um, and the reflection piece, I think, is also, like as you were saying, so important because I think whether it's healthcare, office work, uh, teaching, I think we get so focused on what we do that we haven't taken the time to write down how we feel about it. And it, it could be where it could either be very structured where at the end of the day, you write something down, or it could even be organic where something, then you, then you write it down, but get your thoughts down. Don't worry about grammar. Don't worry about punctuation. No one needs to see it except you, but it is something you can go back and reflect on at a later date or time. But the idea is if you don't do this, it just, dissipates and disappears. A lot of times the when I mentor and coach people and I and I ask them about well tell me about your job. They skim the top surface of what that job is. Mm. And then I start going deeper. But an employer if you're in an interview they're not going to go deeper. But then I'll say well you know well tell me about you know this you know situation uh, what was it like in uh, working with these people and then they're like oh well and then they start digging deeper. And then a personality comes up. And I said, well, how did that personality make you feel? Well, and then they go even deeper. If you write things down, all of a sudden it's, it's captured. Mm -hmm. And you can always expand on it, but it's a trigger point. I call them memory triggers. Even simple little things that you just write down. Today at work, it did this. Uh, one thing I used to do, it just started out because, again, daily gratitudes. Mm -hmm. For four years straight, without missing a day, even when I'm traveling and in different time zones, people knew it because it was now coming at 3 a.m., not at uh, 11 o'clock at night or whatever. But before going to bed every night, I would do what I call a daily gratitude. And I just used to put it on my Facebook page. Today, I was uh, had this occur. And, you know, it was really cool. And, this, and I remember there was one or two times that actually it was like, today, you know what? Not a lot happened, but that was actually a good thing. And, you know, here's why. And I just remember at a certain point after four years of every single day, I said, you know what, maybe it's time to just shelve this away. And I sent a note saying, I greatly appreciate the opportunity that I've had because it was, it was for me that I did these daily gratitudes. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden there was a wave of people who said, don't stop because, mm -hmm. you know, this keeps me going. Wow. Yeah. 
you know, so it's also like you never know the impact that that reflection is going to have. The clarity it provides you will then have that ripple effect to support and help other people. Yeah. And that's in the context of sharing it if you yep. choose to, right? That's me, though. Yeah, exactly. And every and if you're someone who's new to it, I, I do like the idea of both because you know when you're doing a, a constructive formal reflection, you are thinking about it. You're you're reflecting, and I can see that being triggering for some people, depending on the day they've had, um, and why that could be um, a little bit uninviting to them. But maybe, like you said, if you have an outlet that brings you joy, you let go of any resistance. You're not thinking about the day. And other ideas or inspirations or good feelings come to you through through an outlet as well. Yeah, and I, I think of the healthcare space it, myself personally. I think it's really helpful to reflect out loud with others because we can feel very like there's no, it never ends, right? Like it's nonstop. You're on the go. You really don't have much time to chit chat and talk about non healthcare related things or non patient related things, right? Sometimes. And I think to take a moment and actually like mm -hmm. reflect um, and help, like help people to realize that they're not alone can go a long way right now, totally. um, especially right now. So it would be, it would be great if that was more fostered and facilitated and there was, yeah. you know, a time and a place for that during during work in a way. Well, and Jennifer, to be fair, I mean, healthcare workers, you are interacting and engaging people with people at the worst of times. Yeah, always. And you're, you're shouldering all of the um, anxiety, you're shouldering all of the anger, frustrations. Um, you know, it's coming on your shoulders. And there's a term for it called emotional labor. Mm. And there's this idea that, uh, you know, Anybody who's in the either healthcare, first responder, service industry, it doesn't matter. When you're engaging with people, they're transferring their anxiety, anger, and frustration onto the other person. And emotional labor basically says, okay, how do you take it, purpose it, and uh, not let it affect you? Uh, one way that I can share is, even for myself, is it's a it's actually a really a mindset piece that once it I did that again it offered me some clarity because you know think of it this way I'm talking to three to eight people a week and some of them are sharing some very difficult times so, and some people have even shared that they've contemplated suicide they've gone through a bad relationship and you know I'm I'm just listening to what they have to say so I get positive and I get the challenges but People said, you know, how is it that you don't let this burn you out? Mm -hmm. How is it that uh, you carry on? And do you ever get angry or frustrated or what, or, you know, concerned like that it's overwhelming? And I said, actually, I'm concerned when they don't come to me any longer. Mm. Verse. But I said, here's the thing. If I saw my life as a giant bucket and there's a room full of people and I'm pouring my contents into their buckets, I'm ex absorbing and all of that. What's happening to my bucket? It's depleting. Mm -hmm. So many times we feel like that bucket because our, our lives are, you know, we limited and whatnot and we're depleting. But then I had a mindset and it was a shift because I said, actually, no, I'm not a bucket. I'm a candle. I'm a lit candle. Mm -hmm. And there's a room full of unlit candles. And when we touch our wicks, a giant flame emerges. But as we pull apart, my flame is no less depleted. Mm -hmm. But now you've lit somebody else. So I go through life lighting up a room or lighting up people. And I don't mean that in the sense of in a joyous way, I light up right. a room. <laughs> it's about lighting up another person because, you know, and, and I found that as soon as that mindset was, I'm a candle, not a bucket. It allowed me that safety valve to say, I can carry on doing this because I'm focusing at, on it, not from a standpoint of what's it draining out of me, but what is it that I can give to other people? Mm -hmm. And it actually, by that mindset, it's enabled me to have these 5,000 conversations to date. Wow, that's incredible. And, you know, and, and compassion is one of those things that does refuel you, mm -hmm. right? And it, and it doesn't take much of an investment. I think we can be, um, and I know for myself personally, um, that we can be hard on ourselves as providers, right? And I, I think it comes back down to that and not recognizing that we really are having an impact in that the smallest of impact does go a long way and can light up a room or a family situation or whatever it might be at that time. Awesome. So I wrote a couple things down. So 
one of the things I wanted to ask you Mm -hmm. is empathy. You talked about that. So when I think of empathy, you know, it's, it's trying to understand other people's feelings and perspectives, the way they're thinking as well. Um, So when it comes to patient provider interaction, so if you think about healthcare providers kind of on the brink of burnout, or feeling exhausted, how do we still dig deep enough to still find empathy within Mm -hmm. us to, to connect with patients again, and still provide, you know, great care? Yeah, I mean, it's always difficult, because with the whole idea of, you know, you've, you've got people at their worst. Mm-hmm. And even no matter how much of a brave face you put on, it may be slapped by, not physically, but, but verbally by someone who's laying in a bed. Why is the doctor not coming by? Or, you know, I've been here for five hours and, uh, you know, you guys don't care. Again, it's a, it's a difficult one because with, with that whole idea of empathy, it, it, again, it goes back to being able to take the time to then share with someone else. And again, it's not about having it shouldered onto someone else, but it's just, you know, other people around you, especially in the healthcare industry can totally understand, can say, you know, it's, it's fine. Like, do you need me to just step in for a moment? Uh, Just, do you want to uh, take a moment and all that? And it's okay. You're, it's not a, a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. When you say, you know what, I just need a moment. And, you know, in that regard. So empathy as well, it it is about that whole perspectives and about uh, trying to understand the situation around you. You know, what's this person going through? They're going through a difficult time. Uh, I think that uh, oftentimes it's very easy, whether not even in the healthcare industry, anywhere else, it's always easy to judge somebody based on their actions and reactions. But we really don't know what the circumstances are. Mm-hmm. You could be in an office and somebody's just, you know, not being friendly or or whatnot. And it's easy to just say, well, you know, they're just not a nice person. Maybe they've had a situation at home, a health uh, situation at home with a parent or something like that. And they're going through stuff. Mm-hmm. So I think one of the most important things is don't judge. Mm-hmm. But then also at the same time, try to have an that outlet and not just a, you know the physical outlet but even that support outlet that allows you to just lower that volume a little bit to say okay this I'm, I'm not having a really good day today and you know instead of taking it out on other people or the patients or family members you know find an outlet that even if it means being able to talk to somebody around you but the key thing is they have to be able to listen to you and not judge mm-hmm. or respond back with, yeah, that person in that bed, yeah, they're really cranky ass. It doesn't matter and whatnot. Again, that doesn't help the situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's more of how can you support the person who's coming to you and uh, help them? Yeah, I love that. Um, and it's so true. Like I've heard from many healthcare providers that, when they get home, for example, so they're very patient and empathetic at work, when they get home, they kind of let let loose a bit, right? Like they, they feel like they can't regulate as well, or empathize as well with their own family. And to me, it's, it's, you know, that kind of is hard, because uh, hard to swallow, because, you know, we spend a lot of time at work, and we give so much that we should be able to enjoy our personal time too. And, um, you know, not burn out during that as well, or disconnect. Um, So the outlet becomes really important. And I think that might be a good suggestion for people to, um, to start even, you know, before they go home or something. I know for me, like, sometimes I'll go for a longer car ride, and I'll listen to music and whatever it might be to decompress in a way. um, And just kind of fill myself back up. And And it could even be regulated where, you know, Uh, whether if you're a single parent or even if you've got that family environment uh, is just to say, okay, guys, you know, when I get home, I just need an hour. Just Mm -hmm. you could say hello and everything and all that, but just give me a bit, a little bit of time to just let this out of my system. Mm -hmm. And it could do wonders. Cause I know that, for example, I've I've got two boys and I always tell them when it comes to podcasting um, guys, I really need you to not be running around, not getting into these tussles and fights. So guys, can you just give me this one hour 
And uh, they're like, okay, yeah. And then as soon as this call's over, well, I have another one a bit later on. You know that in the half hour, it's going to be rambunctious around this house. But then the next hour, I'll be like, guys, okay, I'm going back in there again. I need you to cooperate with me here. And I think that's what we need to do is really share with the people around us, even if it's children, if, even if it's uh, your parents, uh, that they need to understand that I just need a little bit of time. And, just, um, and you, there's things that you can do with that time. And in speaking to what you've talked about, I don't know if it relates specifically to what I'm going to say, but but finding your voice. Mm -hmm. I think that self empowerment piece we lack as providers sometimes because we don't use our voice. We don't say maybe we need an hour. We don't, you know what I mean? Because we're just so used to giving, giving, giving. Is there any way or any words of inspiration you can give for healthcare providers to kind of express themselves without? judging themselves in that process of doing so or feeling like they're asking too much of others or anything like that? Well, I think one of the biggest things is realize you're human. And, uh, you know, just the fact that you are entitled to, and I, and I really use that word entitled, because for what you've just gone through, even on a daily basis, your shift, you don't, you know, think of all the things that have happened on your shift. Yeah. No, you've earned the right. You've entitled yourself to a little bit of that free time, whatever that may be. And I think you need to say, it's almost like you need to own that free time. And don't think of it as being selfish or, you know, uh, privilege in that regard. No, no, it's it's about earning that. And I know that there are times where I've come home. Uh, it's been a very difficult day with all the conversations, everything around me and everything. And I just, and I do tell them, like, guys, I just need a little bit of time just to, because if you give me a little bit of time, hey, I'm back again, and then you you decide what we're going to do. But let's just, uh, I just need a little bit of time. I think you got to own it. You've earned it. Claim it. Uh, it's like a lottery ticket. Just claim that prize. Yeah. And the same thing when you're working the front lines, like you had mentioned earlier, I think in asking for help. That's, that is also using your yep. voice and saying, you know what, I need I need a moment. Do you yep. mind helping this person? Or I'm really struggling with this patient. Yep. Uh, can you step in or something? Which is, I, I think, empowering, like you yep. said, and not so much as a sign of weakness. Yeah. But we're so used to just pushing through it, and it just creates more conflict sometimes internally and externally, right? Totally. Yeah. yeah. So this has been wonderful. I really appreciate you being here. Um, can you share with us where people can connect with you, Sam? Sure. So, I mean, uh, I've got my website. So that's www.sam-thiara.com. So just my name. Uh, mm -hmm. At the same time, I'm on LinkedIn and available there, Instagram and Twitter. So if you Google my name, you'll find me everywhere. And at the same time, it's sometimes just nice to have a conversation. And you know what? Be one of the, well, beyond the 5,000 now, but uh, always happy to have a conversation. And I always like to remind people that a simple idea and concept, it's a, it's, I call this the puzzle analogy. And I just wanted to share this with people because I think it really applies here. So what I do is I wind up handing out puzzle pieces to people. And those are ordinary. There's not much you can do with one single piece, but this is what people feel like. They feel like that single piece of a jigsaw puzzle because they don't know where they fit in and what's the bigger picture. But I always tell people, but instead of being that single piece and ordinary, I'm going to make it extraordinary, but I'm going to make you extraordinary. Because I say, if I give you a single piece of a jigsaw puzzle, my puzzle is now incomplete without you. Do you realize how important you are to me? And my puzzle will be incomplete. So I really want your listeners to realize that they are part of something bigger. You're not in this by yourself. And if I ever give you a piece of a jigsaw puzzle, I can't finish my puzzle without you. And it just want, I want to demonstrate how important people are. It's gone so far as, well, over 5,000 pieces, but I've got people who have taped it on their mirror. They say it reminds me every morning someone said I'm important. Yeah. It's uh, traveled around the world in backpacks. It's in curio boxes, in wallets, or people come frantically looking for me saying, I lost my piece. I need another one. It's just a simple little p uh, idea that just, I think many people need. And if it means even in your hospital, yeah. start giving people puzzle pieces and telling them how important they are to your puzzle. And it's just showing connectedness. It's showing uh, empathy and care. And it shows that support that's around you. 
Yeah, I love that. That's, that's beautiful. I was just thinking that that should be an almost every team environment, <laughs> right? Like that concept, and that interconnectedness. You know, um, when my dad passed, my dad passed in 2018, I wrote my, my book based on his journey in healthcare and chronic illness. And um, when he was sick, more sick and passing, basically, I, I was starting to see dimes everywhere. And then after he passed, I kept seeing dimes. And I've, I've since found a couple at work. So I have them taped on my, like where my workstation is, and I have them taped there so that I know I'm not always alone. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, there's there, like you said, we're a part of something bigger. That's my personal connection and spiritual connection to him that way. And it reminds me of that. But, um, you know, interpersonally we're all connected but i think even beyond that as well and i and i think um yeah i think we're i think we're doing good <laughs> i think i think we're gonna be okay <laughs> you're you're doing exceptional yeah. and you know i think there's a lot of peer, people around who just admire and respect the work that the healthcare providers do yeah um, so yeah Thank you, Sam. I appreciate you being here and sharing your wisdom. I highly recommend people check out your website and listen to your, uh, your TEDx talks. They were wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you again. So if you guys like this podcast, please subscribe and leave an honest review. Your feedback means everything to me. Your reviews are what moves this podcast forward, and I always appreciate receiving them. If you want to get a hold of me directly, reach out to me on social media. My handles are in the show notes, and you can always subscribe to my weekly newsletters at jennifergeorge.co so that we can stay connected. So until next time, thank you guys so much again for your ongoing support support.